My message today is titled The Message of Christmas. As we're doing our Christmas carol today, I know we still have service on Christmas Day, uh, but today we are talking about the message of Christmas. And by God's grace, next week we have a guest minister who will tell us a little bit more about the message of Christmas. Please turn with me your Bibles to John chapter 3, and we read verse 16 to 21. John 3, 16 to 21. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. And the Bible says God so loved the world. That's probably the very first memory verse that I learned as a child and most children, this is one of the first memory verses that they learned. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but should have everlasting life. So God's action was purely motivated by the love that he has for the world. His action in sending his only begotten son was driven a thousand times by love. Now, a thousand times in history, babies have been born who then became kings. But Christmas is unique in the sense that it's the first and only time that a king was born, a king became a baby and was born. So, that's the uniqueness we celebrate. Several times babies are born and they may end up becoming king. But Jesus was not born to become a king. He was a king who chose the form of a baby. The Bible says, being God himself, he chose to come in the appearance of humans because of the love that God has for us. But why did God have to send his son? I think that's the million dollar question. Why, did, why, why was there even the necessity for God to send his son? The answer we find in Romans chapter 3, verse 24 to 25. Can I have that in the message translation, please? He said, God did this for us. Out of sheer generosity, he put us in right standing with himself, a pure gift. He got us out of the mess we're in and restored us to the uh, to where he always wanted us to be. And he did it by means of Christ Jesus. And verse 25, God sacrificed Jesus on the altar of the world to clear that world of sin. Having faith in him sets us in the clear. God decided on this course of action in full view of the public to set the world in the clear with himself through the sacrifice of Jesus finally taking care of the sins he had so patiently endured. I think that summarizes it. This is why God had to send the son to deal with that sin issue, that sin question. Recognize that the sin issue has been a concern for God since the fall of man at the Garden of Eden. Out of God's love, he chased Adam and Eve out of the garden, not only because they sinned, in fact, that was not the main reason he chased them out, but because he did not want them to eat from the tree of, uh, tree of life in their sinful state. Otherwise, what it means is that man will live forever in perpetuity in that fallen state. That would have been game over. Genesis chapter 3, verse 22 to 24. Let's read that. And see, this is what happened after they had sinned. The Bible said, Then the Lord God said, Look, the human beings have become like us, knowing both good and evil. 
What if they reach out, take fruit from the tree of life, and eat it, then they will live forever. And verse 23. So God banished them from the Garden of Eden. He sent Adam out to cultivate the ground from which he had been made. And verse 24. After sending them out, the Lord God stationed mighty cherubim to the east of the Garden of Eden, and he placed a flaming sword that flashed back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. So God chased them out and made it impossible for them to come back. And the motivation was that God did not want them to eat of the tree of life in that falling state of knowing between good and evil. Sin became so big an issue that God decided at some point to reset everything and destroy the world that he had put the effort into creating. And he decided to do that in the days of Noah. And that was the account of the flood. And that was supposed, the intention was that the, the, the Bible said the sin was too much and God could no longer be in, and he said he was going to destroy the world. That was supposed to be a reset, but that was not enough. Unfortunately, that only gave a temporary reprieve, but did not eliminate the sin problem. God gave the law of Moses, which was one big experiment that lasted thousands of years. Although it's called the law, it was not just one law. As a matter of fact, it comprised a hectic 613 commandments that the nation of Israel were expected to deal with, with the, to, to keep in order to deal with the issue of sin. It was simply impossible for anyone to keep them. Have you, if, during your quiet time, I hope I can encourage you in the new year. It's always a good thing. Every year I try to go through the Bible uh, one time. So it's a good thing. If you've not done it before, do it next year. Read the book of Leviticus. Read the book of Exodus and see some of those laws. And it, it will amaze you. Even some physiological natural occurrences will make you unclean. <laughs> you touch a dead person, you are unclean. As in so many things that would make you, it was just an impossible thing. And the Bible says in that Romans 3.25 that God had patiently endured this sin issue for so long. Imagine God bearing all of that all through those years. Yet, in all the requirements of the law, God was showing us a shadow of what the final price that will be paid for our sin will be. Through the law, one of the things that was introduced through the law was the concept of substitution. The concept of substitution was introduced. Where a person's sin could be passed, or not just even a person's sin, the sin of a nation could be passed onto a sacrificial animal, and the innocence of that animal was in turn imputed onto the person. So all of Israel's sin could come on one animal, and they used to call that animal the scapegoat in those days. Now, in primary school, some of us that were stubborn, they used to use the word scapegoat for us. We didn't know where it came from. <laughs> now, we understand. Leviticus chapter 16, verse 6 to 10. You see the concept of substitution there. It says, Aaron will present his own bull. Aaron was the priest, the chief priest. Will present his own bull as a sin offering to purify himself and his family, making them right with the Lord. So when he's purified himself and his family, now he can come on behalf of the nation. Then he must take the two male goats and present them to the Lord at the entrance of the tabernacle. He is to cast sacred lots to determine which goat will be reserved as an offering to the Lord and which will carry the sins of the people to the wilderness of Azazel. Aaron will then present as a sin offering the goat chosen by lot for the Lord. Then the other goats, the scapegoats chosen by lot to be sent away, will be kept alive, standing before the Lord. When it is sent to Azazel in the wilderness, the people will be purified and made right with God. So when that goat takes away their sin into the wilderness, they become purified. They receive that innocence. They 
past their sins on the scapegoat, they got the innocence. So God, even in all of that, foreshadowed the ultimate model through which the price of our sins will be paid. In that, somebody innocent will come and have to take the sin of the whole world on himself so that we can get the righteousness of God imputed unto us. There was no other way that the sin question was going to be answered. So God foreshadowed the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross where he will take the sin of the world on himself and in exchange we get the righteousness of God. This was why John at some point, John the Baptist, described Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This was the only way the sin issue could be dealt with permanently. Only a pure, sinless one could pay the price. And for that person to do that, that person had to be the very son of God himself. Otherwise, no one else would have been able to do it. Because even Aaron, the high priest, he had to first sacrifice for himself. You are the high priest, but you are not pure enough. You still have to do a sacrifice for yourself before you can represent the nation. So the Christmas message is that the price has been paid. Praise the Lord. Jesus came. And this is why when Jesus was born, the angels declared joy to the world. Joy to the world. Because what they were saying is from this moment onwards, God is not angry with the world anymore. Right. Because he sent his son to make peace. That old question of sin that God has had to endure forever, now he has sent his son to deal with it permanently, once and for all, so that it no longer becomes an issue. The message of Christmas is that you no longer have to remain an enemy of God. And John made it very clear in that John chapter 3, verse 16. He said, only the people that love evil shy away from the light. They stay away. They don't want to come to the light. The light has been revealed, yet they don't want to come to it. But the people who are genuine seekers in their heart, this is an opportunity to seek God. And the Bible says it's a simple decision that needs to be made that determines whether a person has everlasting life or whether they have eternal damnation. All you have to do is to make a choice to believe. If you believe, then you are saved. If you don't, if you don't believe, by that very choice, you have condemned yourself to eternal dam damnation. And so the message of Christmas is like a double-edged sword. It's good news because we only have to do one thing, which is believe. God has done all the work in his son. But it's also bad news that if people make the deliberate choice to reject the sacrifice that Jesus has already made, then by that choice, they set their destination of their own eternity. And that's why John 3, 17 said, God didn't send Jesus into the world to condemn the world. That was far from God's idea. He sent Jesus to save the world. But the person who believes is saved. The one who does not believe is already condemned. They don't have to wait. You know, you don't have to wait to die to know what your fate will be. From the moment you reject Jesus, your fate is sealed. Praise the Lord. You know you are already condemned. That's a decision and a choice that you make. So hell is not a place God sends people to. I've heard some agnostics and atheists argue. How can a loving God create hell and send people there? Well, the good news is he didn't create hell for you. Amen. He wouldn't send you to hell. You send yourself to hell at the end of the day when you reject Jesus. As a matter of fact, we were on our way to hell. And he sent Jesus to come and rescue us. But the rescue ship can be there. The boat can be there. I don't, I don't know how many of you have heard this story of a man who knew that a storm was coming. It's been announced so many times. And yet he would not escape. A boat came, he didn't come. Helicopter came, he didn't come. And he kept saying God will save me. And eventually God said, I've sent three different things. 
to save you. You didn't get on any of them. And this is exactly how it is. People were already on their way to destruction. God sends Jesus. And yet the world rejects Jesus. And then they say, how can a loving God send anyone to hell? And the Bible is very clear. He doesn't. But our decision will determine where we find ourselves. So the good news is that you only have to make a choice. Salvation is yours. Hell is not a place God sends people to. It is a place people send themselves to. And one more thing, I'll round up. Now, all this bit I said is especially for those who are yet to come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Because Christmas is all about you. It's for you. Every year that we do Christmas is a reminder to you that many years ago, God paid the price. And as long as you breathe, that is God still giving you an opportunity to make that right decision before it's time up for you. That's the message of Christmas. But for those of us that are believers, there's still a message in Christmas for us. And the message is that he that believes, the Bible says, has everlasting or eternal life. It was always God's desire for us to have eternal life. You know, when I read the account of Genesis again, it's clear to me that it was always God's desire for us to have eternal life. In that same garden of Eden, the Bible says there was the tree of life. And do you know that God did not tell Adam and Eve not to eat of that tree? He didn't tell them not to eat of that tree. They could eat of every tree except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In fact, the only time God put a, a measure in place to stop them from eating from it was when they had fallen. Up until that time, they could partake of the tree of life. Why would God put it there if he didn't want them to eat of it? He always desired that we will have eternal life. And that's why he went all the way to make sure that Jesus brought that eternal life back to us. So that that eternal life is now available to us in Jesus. People of God, eternal life does not only mean that after you die, you will be with God forever or you will live forever in heaven. It doesn't only mean that. It means that, but it means much more. Eternal life is something we have now. Is not something we get when we die. Eternal life is already in us. It means we have the God kind of life. Another word describing it is the Zoe life. The Zoe life is what we've got. The supernatural life of God is at work in us. You can live the supernatural life of God now. It is that life that is at work in us that makes us kingdom citizens. It is that life that is at work in us that makes us also become children of God. Because one of the things Jesus did with Christmas in coming to die for our sins is that he now no longer is the only son of God. He brought us as children into adoption. We have also become children of God because the life of God is in us. So God's kind of life is at work in you. You can live the supernatural life. In early 2023, we'll be talking more about the supernatural life because it's so important to understand that this life makes you a different person. It makes you totally a different person. You need to see yourself differently because the life of God is now at work in you. That supernatural life grants you access to so many things in God. So the message of Christmas, if I may summarize, is that Christ came to make peace between us and God by paying for sin permanently so that all we have to do is make a choice between eternal life by placing our faith in Jesus or eternal condemnation by rejecting the gift of salvation that Jesus offers. The message of Christmas for those of us that are believers is that the very life of God is in us. We have eternal life now. It's not something we're going to have in the future. We already have it now. The life of God is in us and it's at work in us. 
and we will consider more about that as we go on. Let us bow down our heads in prayer. We're going to sing a song today, and the choir will lead us. It's a song that we would all learn. Um, it's a song, for me, it's my Christmas song, a song of what Jesus means to us all. It's by C.C. Winans, and it's I Have a Savior.
is our future, is our hope. All you will ever need is Jesus. I made that decision 31 years ago. And I can tell you, all I have ever needed and all I will ever need is Jesus. So today if you're listening and you haven't made that decision at any point to ask Jesus to be the savior of your soul, to receive eternal life that is in Jesus, with all heads bowed, all eyes closed, I want to give you that opportunity as we celebrate the birth of Jesus today to make a decision that eternal life is yours from this moment going forward. Can you just wave your hands to me? You don't have to be shy about this. This is going to be the best decision ever. I see a few hands. God bless you. Just wave your hands if you haven't made that decision. It's going to be the best decision you will ever make. I guarantee you that. If you're waving your hands, can you say these words after me? Father, I thank you for sending your son Jesus to die for my sins. I confess today that I have sinned and fallen short of your glory. I place faith in Jesus alone and I ask that you save me totally from my sins. I confess that I believe that you raised Jesus from the cross for me. And from this moment, I declare that I am no longer a slave to sin. I am a child of God. If you prayed that prayer and believed the words that you confessed in your heart, I have good news for you. You are saved. Hallelujah. You are saved. It's as simple as that. But right now, because of that decision you made, your eternity is decided forever. Hallelujah. From this moment, you are saved. I want to rejoice with you today. And I ask you to please meet with myself or one of the members of the admin after the service so we can lead you in the way to start to grow in this new knowledge. If you made that decision online, can you please send us a message or send us an email to info at cianorthampton.org to Jesus by His grace and mercy I'm saved Father, we just want to thank you. Thank you for the gift of Jesus. Thank you for the miracle of the new birth that you've performed here today. Thank you for the supernatural life that is at work in us. Help us live in these realities. For in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen.